In this video segment, I want to go over some common types of scores and ways of describing them that you might encounter from vendors or patrons or in catalogs. This may be a bit of review for those with extensive music backgrounds, so feel free to just go through the slides with text instead of sitting through the video if you just need a quick refresher. Facsimiles are photographic representations or reproductions of an early version, typically of a manuscript or a very early printed score. They might accompany an edited score or they might appear alone, and they often try to replicate the details of the original, sometimes down to holes in the page or raised painted letters. Often facsimiles will be published that recreate the autograph or holograph, that is the copy of the work that survives in the creator's own handwriting. Um, if that survives, it may be replicated uh, at the beginning of, a, of an edition or as a standalone edition. Academics and professional performers will frequently choose an urtext edition, which tries to establish the most authoritative edition by drawing on sources the editor deems most important. Often that's a single source that can be traced closest to the composer, as that's taken to represent their intentions. This might be the autograph manuscript or a first edition, for example. Urtext editions usually avoid any editorial editions or changes and present the musical text in as near to the original form as possible. They claim to represent the ultimate version of the work as the composer intended it. Urtext editions are really popular with performers who want to access the composer's intentions and make their own decisions about performance details without the intervention of a modern editor. The phrase critical edition is sometimes used interchangeably with urtext, uh, but they're not quite the same. Both are kinds of scholarly editions, but critical editions often incorporate more than just the one best source um, and may even spend time identifying variants or differences between existing sources. For example, they might look at the autograph, the first few editions in different countries, uh, surviving performance parts from an early performance, and so on. They sometimes have footnotes or other references in the score to indicate variants, um, and they're often intended for study rather than performance. However, they may be the basis for performing editions or other arrangements. Collected works and monuments are multi-volume scholarly editions, usually either dedicated to all the works by a specific composer or from a particular period or genre, uh, and they may be published little by little over many, many years. Um, they can be a little difficult to navigate because the volumes include multiple pieces, so sometimes you need to refer to reference sources to figure out where a particular piece might be within the collected edition. Critical and urtext editions are usually full scores, meaning they include all the parts arranged in score order one on top of the other. Conductor scores, which are not very common in academic libraries, are full scores in large print for the conductor to read and mark. More common in libraries are study or miniature scores, which are full scores printed in a small format too small generally to perform or conduct from. They're meant for study and analysis, so they're very common in library collections. And they often include essays or other uh, reference materials. Vendors often offer music in sets with a study score accompanied by individual parts for each instrument printed separately. These scores and parts are designed for ensemble performance. They're fairly rare in public library settings, but they're pretty common in academic libraries and of course in performance libraries. Typically academic libraries will only acquire sets of scores and parts up to a certain size, maybe 10 or 12 players, because they start to get unwieldy to handle and shelve over that size. In a university setting, the music department might have a, typically have its own in-house collection of scores and parts for larger ensembles that it keeps to support those in-house ensembles. You may also find piano reductions of music for ensembles that are reduced to just the core of the work and arranged to be played on a keyboard instrument. Piano reductions can be for just piano or a piano and a solo instrument. These might also be labeled condensed or short scores because the full score has been condensed or shortened down into the space of a single grand staff. Piano vocal scores, also called just vocal scores, are very common in libraries of all kinds because they reduce a piece for a large ensemble with vocals, like a chorus or an operatic work, to something performable by voice and keyboard. The vocal students will often perform from these arrangements, and they're very popular with amateur pianists and singers too. 
I also wanted to point out that you'll often hear sheet music used as a synonym for scores, but in a music history and music library context, it's usually used more precisely and isn't used as a catch-all term for printed music. In this narrower sense, sheet music is for solo instrument, piano, or piano and voice, so only for one or two parts, and it's usually sold without a binding or cover. So there may be an illustrated cover sheet, but it's made of more or less the same paper as the music inside. And sheet music is usually just a handful of pages stapled or sewn together. So it's a, a sheet of music. It's mostly used to refer to a single mass produced work, but sometimes owners, especially in the 19th century, would have their collections bound together in a volume known as a binder's volume. These are always really interesting because it's mass produced commercially available music, but the exact collection and arrangement of the music in the binder's volume tells you something about the people who owned it and their tastes and abilities. So you'll often see studies of binder's volumes, but you'll probably only encounter those if you work in a special collection or archive. If you're working with popular music or jazz, you'll also encounter lead sheets, a sheet with the bones of the work that can then serve as the basis for improvisation or arrangement. For a long time, this was the form popular music composers used for copyright deposit because it represents the sort of basic identity of the work. Tablature, on the other hand, is a form you often see used for guitar, where instead of or in addition to indicating pitch, the notation indicates physical fingering. The lines in tab for guitar or other stringed instruments represent strings instead of pitches. Tab isn't only for guitar. You'll see it for banjo and other string instruments, as well as for organ and harmonica sometimes. Um, it's been in use for lutes and guitars since the Renaissance. You'll won't, you won't see that as often in academic um, libraries, but you'll see it frequently in public libraries. The musical formats we've been talking about so far refer to the content of the music. How many parts are presented, how are they arranged, and so on. In some cases, these might depart enough from the original version to be considered a separate expression in Ferber terms. These categories overlap with the physical formats, but they aren't precisely the same. Differences in physical format operate more at the manifestation level. A hardcover version of the Schirmer edition of the Beethoven sonatas and a version they issued with comb bindings are different manifestations of the same expression. Some of the musical formats more or less align with physical printing formats. Parts and sheet music are typically printed in soft cover uh, with sewn or stapled into gatherings. Study scores are typically intended for study and are printed in smaller miniature formats. Folio scores are large. They're often composer scores or works printed in graphic notation. And those large items can be difficult to shelve, so they're often sh stored on a separate shelf. In general, scores in a music library will arrive either softbound or in hardcover. Hardcover is generally considered preferable because of the wear and tear on items and the fact that they stand up better on a shelf. So many libraries will send out softbound scores to be rebound in a hard library binding. Uh, though this might be changing, in a recent conversation on the MLA listserv, some people indicated that they're considering either switching to just stiffening the covers with a cardboard insert or waiting until a score has circulated some to bother sending it out for rebinding. A major concern here was, of course, the cost, but even more of an issue was the fact that waiting to accumulate enough scores to send out, then sending them out and waiting for them to return, keeps new items out of circulation for months. So it keeps us from serving patrons as well. Comb and spiral bindings are often desirable for performers for their personal collections because they lay flat, um, but they're the worst binding type for circulation because of wear and tear and also because they aren't very efficient for shelving. Um, and libraries tend to avoid them completely or if they must purchase something that has been comb or spiral bound, libraries will often um, have them rebound immediately. So comb and spiral bindings are popular with musicians but are not well suited to library use. Another type of music format that comes up briefly in the readings is the electronic file. Increasingly, musical editions are available in digital forms. Composers often self-publish in PDF, or you may find music in files belonging to a particular notation program like Sibelius or Finale or MuseScore. In digital humanities work, there's also increasing use of encoded formats like MusicXML and MEI. 
these formats encode details about the music, its formatting and notational characteristics in a way that can be rendered by those notation programs like Sibelius, but are also analyzable by computer programs. So researchers can use languages like Python to create queries and use them for large scale analysis. Often people in these fields will distribute music in the encoded forms so that the user can display it or analyze it in whatever way they like. In some cases, any of these file formats might be used in creating interactive online editions. Online editions offer a lot of interesting possibilities for comparison and analysis that are more cumbersome with physical editions. Um, in the example I've screenshotted here, you can toggle between a reproduction of the original medieval notation and modern score notation. Um, and you can listen to a MIDI recording synchronized with the score, and you can download the score in PDF or MEI format for performance or analysis. All of these digital forms for editions are becoming more common, and they offer a lot of advantages, but they also create some headaches for music librarians. Should we add open access online editions to our catalogs? How do we acquire PDF scores that are self-published on a composer's website? And how do we store and circulate the files once we have them? It's important to know that all the formats you might deal with as a music librarian, but I think the questions raised by electronic score formats are gonna be a big part of our conversations in the field over the next several years. As we'll see when we get into discussion of cataloging, some of the physical and intellectual formats are considered meaningful in cataloging and resource description, and others are important to users, but not likely to be described in catalogs. Score is typically used for full scores of all kinds with inclusion of facsimiles described um, as an additional detail, um, as well as measurements. Most catalogs will also describe if parts are included and how many. Study score is the standard description for miniature or study scores, even if they're described in other ways in titles or series names. Other details like whether the score is an urtext or a critical edition might be part of the description somewhere in the catalog, but it won't be in the format line. We'll talk more about the categories for formats for music in a few weeks when we get to cataloging. I'm going to talk much more briefly about the physical formats for recordings, which will fall under the category of carrier types when we start talking about cataloging. There are a lot fewer recording formats that you're likely to encounter um, in a typical library. The most common one you'll encounter is going to be audio discs. We tend to think of digital discs as a totally different category than analog discs as uh, music listeners. But I've put them together here because when we start talking about cataloging, then CDs, LPs, um, and other kinds of discs will all be described as audio discs. Additional description is then added that describes the size of the disc and whether it's digital or analog and some other details. So in the case of this catalog entry, I can figure out that a four and three quarter inch digital disc is a CD, um, but the cataloger has added a note to that to the note field to say that it's a compact disc, but the cataloging format doesn't actually use that language. In this example, you can see that the disc is analog and three, 33 and a third RPM, stereophonic, 12 inch. Um, that's all been added, which allows me to figure out that it's vinyl. Um, although again, there's no language for vinyl or record included in the catalog entry. It's less likely that you'll encounter tapes in your library career unless you're working in a special collections or archive. Um, but again, audio cassette here is used to indicate a cassette tape with analog following it. Um, a digital analog, a digital audio tape would also be described as an audio cassette, but with digital afterwards. Um, you may also encounter reel-to-reel -reel tapes, although audio reels are a separate category in cataloging, separate carrier type. Of course, again, the future is likely to be focused on digital music, especially streaming audio, which is becoming increasingly central to academic and public library collections. Um, in terms of format, those are often listed either based on the carrier, so whether it's on a CD-ROM or CD or uh, USB or other uh, 
physical format, or if the for streaming audio, the format will be listed as online resources. Again, the increasing reliance on digital files brings up a lot of questions about the future of music libraries. Um, if we rely entirely on streaming resources, do we give up some of our um, ability to collect specifically for our patrons and turn over a lot of that selection responsibility to vendors? Uh, how do we store files if we prefer to own digital files that are not associated with the physical carrier? There are a lot of um, questions about the future of music libraries that arise from this increasing reliance on digital audio files.